So with those words, I will ask you to, to turn to Romans chapter 8, one of the most, probably the most affirming assurance passages in the scripture. Um, friends, the world is falling away from God, but the church need not. And we need not believe that we'll reap the same end as those who have not seen Christ as Lord in their lives. And so the Apostle Paul gives us really this great celebration. And I'll read again for you this morning the first 11 verses and look at it a, a little differently than we looked at it last week. So Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, Paul wrote to the Romans, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Oh, Father, we praise you for the Holy Spirit this morning, the great blessing of Christ to those who believe. And we pray that he dwells in us individually and in your church corporately. And we pray with a rushing mighty wind we might know his presence this morning, O oh Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For to those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. We can't entirely escape the flesh, friends. But as I've always said, living to the Spirit has to do with the road you're on. What de destination are you headed to? You know, we talk a, a lot about people's lives and how they... They made a profession of faith, but they don't seem in our eyes to be living for Christ. Friends, you can't be living for the devil and living for yourself and expect that you're on the right road, whatever your profession is. That's why he says, if you have the Spirit of Christ, you are his. If you have the Holy Spirit, you'll reap eternal life. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. We labored over this last week. What is your mind set upon? But he says, but to those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So there's this dichotomy. You can live for yourself and the material things of this life, or you can live for eternal things and for the purposes of God. And you can make that choice in, in each moment of your day. And we really do live moment by moment. But Paul bursts onto the scene here from, from chapter 7 to chapter 8 with this wonderful proclamation that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, friends, I, I, again, I labored over the, the phrase in Christ Jesus. We talked about our blessed union with Christ. Being in Christ Jesus is uh, given to us in several metaphors in scriptures. He's the vine with the branches. He's the building where the stones. He's the head where the body, right? He's the husband where the bride, all of these things. But it's for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
it's not just for those who think they're in Christ Jesus. It's not just for those who say they're in Christ Jesus, but it's for those who walk as Jesus walked. Those are the ones who are in Christ Jesus, and that is part and parcel of our assurance. Friends, without fruit to holiness, we really ought not to have any assurance. But if we have that, and friends, we're not talking about your lives are perfected. We never go there. That's a false doctrine, sinless perfection. We're talking, are you progressively becoming sanctified consciously to honor the God that you claim to love? And you know, we're the only religion, really, that, that loves our God. Other religions fear their God. Certainly the pagan, pagans were always running around. They couldn't shed enough blood to make their gods go easy on them. You know, always in fear of their gods. I imagine some of the great religions, it's all about fear. You don't hear a lot about love of God in any other religion than ours. No, we love our God. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so we have this continual refrain throughout this epistle. It speaks of our life. It speaks of our walk. He, Paul is trying to teach us about our position in Christ. In verse 1, we do not walk after the flesh. In verse 5, we do not live according to the flesh. I focused on some of the applications of this last week, as I've said, with regard to real-life examples of what it means to live to the flesh in contrast to what it means to live according to the Spirit. And so we talked about some of those things. We said that living according to the flesh, friends, is living for yourself and your personal appetites and your personal conveniences. Friends, a lot of times morality is inconvenient. It really is. Sometimes being true to one another in a marriage is inconvenient. It can be harrowing. It can be hard. But yet God demands those things of us and claims to give us the power to accomplish it, which I'm going to deal with this morning. Living for the flesh is living according to your personal preferences. You know, when I came into the church back in the 80s, the church and the world were as disparate and far apart as they could be. And in those last 35 years or so, I have seen the church struggling to become more like the world every day. Friends, we are not supposed to be a reflection of the world. We are the refuge from it. And we come here with other believers because we rest in the same principles. And here's the thing. We know they're true. You can't unconvince us of them because they're not merely, they're intellectual, but they're not merely intellectually derived. They are spiritually grounded in us. You can't convince us otherwise. So I've seen Christianity today, it, it's sometimes presented as some of the favorite TV preachers present Christianity as an advantage to you in the material world with regard to getting to know God so that he'll bless your existing goals. Isn't that how it's presented so often? If you'll just come to Jesus, he'll bless your goals, and you can be that rock star you always wanted to be. But that's not what Christianity is at all. Christianity is God getting you to perform his goals. It's a changing of the goals. That's what Christianity is. I remember when I came into the faith, there were things I, I knew, I solidly knew them, but I began to doubt them. And I thought, I better reassess. I better go back into the scriptures and to see if all of these things I thought were true are true. Come to find out, almost none of them were. And you know, when you change your mind like that, what, what do your friends call you? A hypocrite. And you know what? Accept it. Who cares? If changing your mind, which is called repentance, to honor God, if someone puts a bad name on that, own it. Christians have always owned bad names. We were called Protestants because we protested. They were called Puritans because they thought they were so pure. They were called Methodists because they seemed to have a method <laughs> to their madness, <laughs> which was not madness. 
Now, we've, already, we've always just absorbed those things. I see people saying, I'm going to take Baptist off the church sign because Baptist supported slavery in the Civil War and all these things. I said, you, you can, why don't you just clean up the name Baptist and keep the name? Say, yeah, we, we had sin in our past. Guilty. Who are we to run away from a sinful past reputation? We're the ones that are supposed to be admitting it. But we're not that anymore. Yeah, Baptists were that once, but we're not that now. I don't see the problem with that fight at all. I'm willing to have it, even though we never put Baptist on our sign in the beginning. So it really is a non sequitur for us. But Well, we said last week that living according to the Spirit had to do with putting God first in every area of your life. Being concerned with divine commandment over personal inclination. Friends, your personal inclination is likely to be sinful. It's likely to be wrong. It's likely to be unprofitable. And as you grow in Christ, your inclinations get better because they get reformed too. It says in the book of Hebrews that when you mature, your senses learn to discern good and evil. It's like you can smell and taste evil when you've been in Christ long enough. But living according to the Spirit is not living by your immediate inclinations. Living for the Spirit is not a knee-jerk thing, friends. Living according to the Spirit is to put trust over need or perceived need. We have so many perceived needs, friends, that if you really look at them honestly, you'll find out they're not, per- they're not needs, they're excuses. Be very careful with that, because the Lord gives us a diatribe against excuses. He really doesn't like them. The simplest rendering of this relationship is Jesus' words on the mount where he preached, seek first the kingdom of God. And all the other things will take care of themselves, basically, is what he's saying. We focused on the nature and mission of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. For this morning, I would like to focus on the quintessential mission of the Spirit in the life of the believer. What is his mission in your life. And I think that we can derive from this chapter that the mission of the Spirit in our lives is our progressive sanctification. And by the way, I've, I've stood up here week after week and told you, particularly w- with Romans chapter 7, which we're still arguing about it. We still argued about it at the breakfast the other day. And I said how all the commentators disagree. Nobody disagrees that chapter 8's about sanctification. Because sanctification goes to assurance. You can't have assurance without being progressively sanctified and without enlisting the Spirit's help toward that end. So all of those things are agreed by all the commentators that walking and living and setting of the mind upon the things of God are all different ways of speaking about sanctification. Now I want you to know, when you were saved, the moment you were saved, you were sanctified. All right? And what that means is God declared you justified. We labored over that in chapters 4 and 5, right? And to some degree in chapter 6. So God declared you righteous. You were immediately made righteous. And from that justification, your sanctification would grow and you'd ultimately be glorified. Nothing can stop that process. Nothing can stop it. You are absolutely assured that if you were justified, you will be glorified. God does not repent of those kinds of decisions. All right? So you are going to get there. But that kind of sanctification is called positional. It's sort of like the priest in the temple who had all these vessels and all of this, um, all of these drinking vessels and cleansing vessels and things, and he would take these ones and set them aside. They only had one use. They were only for worshiping God once a year when he made intercession for the people of Israel. So he took these vessels and put them over here. He consecrated those vessels. Consecration is much like sanctification. You're set apart for one use. You're already the sanctified, consecrated vessel over here. All right? So you're determined for that. But God knows he chose the foolish things to confound the wise. So we look around, and um, 
I, each day I have new appreciation for that verse about the foolish things <laughs> confounding the wise. Um, be careful that when you say that, you don't have yourself in the, in the position of the wise, because that means you weren't chosen. Um, but our, our sanctification moves forward. It's a dynamic thing. It's not just static. It does, you don't just get set apart and that's the end of it. Now, a lot of people do that, and it's unfortunate. They're not any less saved, but they're not living their full potential in Christ. And I want to talk about that phenomenon this morning. Um, some of you conveyed to me last week that you were convicted by the teaching. You know, I, I do want you to know something. If you ask me after the sermon, Pastor, were you directing that specifically to me? The answer will be yes. Okay, so know that ahead of time. Um, friends, I tend not to do that kind of thing, but I can't help what God intends. And I always told you, I'm glad I don't really have to do this job. It either gets done through the Holy Spirit or it doesn't get done that morning. But if you're convicted, praise God that you know he was speaking to you. I want to tell you something. I haven't talked about my, my book lately, my novel. But in the novel, what you do in a historical novel is you sort of fill in um, with where the history doesn't give you the, all the facts. You sort of, through research, fill in with reasonably um, uh, viable other factors. So I, in the, in the um, section in the, in the novel where Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the book is about Peter. It's sort of his autobiography, right? It's called I Am Peter. Peter is sitting there on the mountain with his head down, and he's hearing the Beatitudes, and he's hearing the similitudes and all the things. A man shall not lust after a woman. A man shall not hate his brother because that's murder. He's hearing all these things. And he's torn up in his soul because he knows the Lord is speaking directly to him. But because he's new at this, he assumes that everyone there, when he looks up, will be staring at him and pointing at him. And so he's there and he's crying in his soul because he's being convicted by the, by the words of Jesus but he says, but I am a man, I'm a man of God, I'm going to open my eyes, I'm going to look my brothers in the eye, and I'm going to face up to what they all know about my sinful life. And so he looked up, and every other person had their head down and was in the same exact place. And each of them thought Jesus was speaking directly to them. And so Peter looked around and he thought, everyone's being convicted. Yes, he, and, and then Jesus makes eye contact with him, and once again he knows, no, he's just speaking to me. <laughs> but that's how conviction is. And it happens, of course, when Jesus is the actual preacher standing there, well, he knows as an in charge of the whole process. When you've got a person like me here, I don't exactly know what these words are going to do in your heart that morning. They may convict you so badly you don't want to come back anymore. That happens. Sadly, that happens. But when it does, you should know where you are before God. Because I don't, I don't make higher standards than God. I don't magnify people's sin. You ask anyone that knows me, I'm, 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 I hold back on judgment until it has to be rendered. Um, so I don't do that kind of thing. So if it's done to you and you think I'm preaching at you, the answer is yes, I am. Because obviously, I just didn't know I was, but apparently I am. So you conveyed to me, many of you last week, it was, uh, it was quite moving, actually, that many of us were convicted. Friends, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Only a believer can be moved in that way and inspired in that way. That's why the apostle speaks of the carnal mind in this passage. And so we, he, we read this in uh, verses 6 and 7. To be carnally minded is death. Carnal minded is and fleshly minded, same thing. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And he goes on to explain that. He says, because the carnal mind is against God. It's the enemy of God. Your old mind, my old mind when I came into the Lord with all of my supposed wisdom and all the conclusions I had about life were all in enmity against God and I had to reassess each of them. And I went to the Bible and I said, well, if the Bible is a fully 
orbed statement of God's will, I, it ought to tell me how to be a good man. It ought to tell me how to be a good citizen of my country, a good brother to my siblings. It would teach me how to certainly how to be a good husband to my wife. The Bible should teach us that, and it does. Uh, uh, very graphically and straightforward. The Bible should teach me how to be a good father, and it does. So you go and you reap all these things, and all your old conclusions melt away, and you're being remade. And this is an essential process. So once you're convicted, let it happen. Get on your knees and praise God that he loved you enough to set you straight. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it's not subject to the law, law of God because it cannot be. It has to be changed before it can be subject. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? You must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. You have to be changed first, and then you enter. Now, there's a doctrine here that we should take note of, and that's this. God's word is for God's people. Really, it is. God's word is for God's people. It's nothing but an ancient manuscript to the unbeliever. It has context for them. It has meaning. You hear unbelievers quote from the Bible all the time. I hear news media people when they're mad at, you know, right-wingers. They'll quote Jesus and show what hypocrites they are. The, you know, the, the, the right-wingers are hypocrites. They claim to be a, a Christian, but look what they do. You know, so everybody, this is my theory, everybody wants Jesus on their side. Whether they believe in the scriptures or not, when it come, push comes to shove, they, to shove, they want to show you that by default they're on Jesus' side and you're the bad guy, when really they have such a spotty knowledge of what, of what he said. But they have no problem quoting from that. To the unbeliever, friends, the scripture is at best ancient wisdom. It's um, maybe historically instructive but it's really ancient myth and legend to most, of the, to most unbelievers. I studied Old and New Testament in college. Full disclosure, it was a Catholic college. Karen took at least one of those courses with me back then. And um, the teacher believed nothing about what we were reading. This was, this was done as sort of a, a, basis, a basis for understanding um, archetypes in... Uh, in um, Western literature. You ever read Moby Dick? The first line of Moby Dick is, call me Ishmael. Now, if you didn't know who Ishmael was, but everyone did in the 1850s, right? Everyone knew who Ishmael was. They knew what that meant. He was the son that was not in covenant with God, and Isaac was. So when Herman Melville says at the beginning of Moby Dick, call me Ishmael, if you didn't know who Ishmael was, you really weren't grasping the story. And what was the name of the evil Captain Ahab. Now, only the Christians knew who Ahab was. You see what I mean? So naturally, if you really want to understand Western literature, and that was my major, you had to understand the scriptures so you could get all the archetypes and things, right? So there's a doctrine here, and it is that God's word is really for God's people. It's nothing but ancient myth and legend to other people. The unregenerate have no access to God through the word unless the Holy Spirit does an operation on them and opens their hearts to it. When the truths of Scripture become a joy to you, then you'll know you've been met by God. He wrote to the Corinthians, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, no one has naturally and on their own auspices come up with what God intends. He says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. It's good, in fact, it's a great privilege, friends, to be moved by the preaching and proclamation of the word. In the individual, it's the essence of progressive sanctification. If you were moved and convicted last week by something that was said from this pulpit, you are progressing in your sanctification. There's something of which you were convicted that you have to repent of. 
And when such convictions happen corporately in a, a whole number of people or a whole congregation, that's the essence of revival. And so it's a good thing to let the Spirit move us forward in our walk. We're being called to increase in knowledge, friends, to mature in discernment, to cultivate lives of prayer and worship. It's part and parcel of the spiritual battle that's ongoing in our minds, and don't think it isn't a battle for your mind, friends. It is. Paul wrote to the Corinthians again, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for pulling down strongholds. That means strongholds of personality. Casting down arguments. Arguments are in your mind, friends. Every high thing that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of God. Everything that interrupts your intellectual absorption, absorption of the character of God is an, is an enemy force trying to win your thoughts. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. And the Holy Spirit is the wielder of those weapons. He casts down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And just to drive home the point that it's a it's a mental intellectual battle. He says, bringing every psalm, certainly. And the psalmist writes, oh, how I live your law. Oh, how I love your law. I think it's a misprint. Sorry if you're looking in the notes. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies. Commandments make you wiser than his enemies. Your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I've restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I've not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. That's the meditation of, of one saint. Engaging in the battle is the essential part of our relationship to the Holy Spirit. We are engaged in the battle through him. We ought to be much concerned to move closer and closer to God. We're set apart by faith. We're sanctified in what I call the static or stationary sense, right? But we're steeped in the word, and that's sanctified in the dynamic sense. Engaging in the spiritual dif disciplines makes your faith dynamic. It makes you walk in it. In order to progress, however, we move from one position to another with regard to our walk with God. We're on the move, and we're advancing towards the prize. We're, take, we're taking our part to advance the cause of Christ in the earth. Friends, we were serving sin and death, but now by faith in Christ... The Spirit of God has moved us into a new position, if you will. We were in sin. We're now in Christ. But as I said repeatedly, being in Christ is only the beginning. We never leave the side of Christ. But arriving there is only a beginning in our walk with God. Being justified is a first step. Friends, just how I had to jettison certain thoughts in my pre-Christian days, I had to jettison some of my early Christian conclusions because they weren't steeped in the Word. And so do many of the, the great theologians and commentators. Certainly Augustine did. That's why the Catholic Church has Augustine as one of their great saints, and we have him as one of ours. He, he changed and grew along the way, right? And so Paul wrote this else, elsewhere. He said, "In this I pray, he said to the church, that your love may abound more and more in what? in knowledge, in all discernment. Who knew that love needed knowledge to abound? Even love needs knowledge. That you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Friends, sanctification is verified by the product, which is the fruit. There's individual fruit. 
You have a memory verse, Galatians 5.22. I'm sorry, everybody read, just say it. Go ahead, I'll just be quiet for a minute. Everybody just say it. No, he, uh, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are character traits that are fruit of the Spirit that should become evident in your life. And that's personal fruit. But there's also corporate fruit, friends. Making disciples. Jesus told the his disciples to go out and make disciples of all the nations. It's corporate fruit. It's outside yourself. Make disciples. He told parents to rear godly offspring. Don't leave them for someone else to rear. Rear them yourself. When you get up, when you lie down, and when you walk by the way, talk about the statutes of God with your children. So that when they come to ask you in time, what do these stones mean, you'll be able to tell them. And if you don't know that reference, look it up. Friends, being fruitful and multiply. That was the gr first great commission. Rare godly offspring. That's corporate. You're bearing fruit just by having your children and then by admonishing them and bringing them up in the love and admonition of the Lord, you're bearing fruit to God in a corporate manner, right? Teaching is corporate fruit. Counseling, serving in any way that you serve. That's all fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so we can see these verses are sanctification verses. Our progressive sanctification is an ongoing process. It's an increasing process. And it goes to our growth and maturity. And remember the writer of Hebrews chastised the church for not growing in his view fast enough, apparently. He said, by this time you ought to have been teachers. But you still need someone to teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. You forgot the basic doctrine. You've come to need milk and not solid food. He's calling them a bunch of babies. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the work, word of righteousness, for he is a babe. He comes right out and calls them babies. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. At some point, we have to grow up in Christ, and it really amounts to a conviction of heart, a decision to do that. I'm going to say that sanctification comes to the believer first through teaching. It's always first through teaching. Teaching is doctrine, friends. When I look up the word in the lexicon, I look up teaching. If you look in your notes, it says, for teaching, see doctrine. So they don't have to write it twice because it's the same thing. They just write it once. So you look up didache in the lexicon. Or didache. <laughs> and the context determines whether it's best translated as teaching or doctrine. Sometimes the Bible takes didache and says teaching. Sometimes the translator says doctrine. But in either case, it's this teaching, it's this understanding of doctrine, which is another name for truth, that refines the walk of the saint. I've had someone say to me even recently, your church is different than ours. Your church is a doctrinal church. In other words, we actually teach principles. I remember, remember John DeBrine, the radio host years ago, Song Time? You young kids probably don't remember. I was on a show once when I, when I was very young in the faith. But John DeBrine was a good commentator. And he said one time, and I never forgot it, he said, doctrine not systematized is jeopardized. Now he's talking about creeds. And, you know, we, we talk about specific doctrines. Justification by faith ought to be something that we know is the name of a scriptural doctrine. The priesthood of all believers is the name of a doctrine. The deity of Christ, the cardinal doctrine of our faith, Jesus Christ is God. We ought to know that as a particular doctrine. And when we know it that way, when it's systematized, it makes it much more easily absorbed and systematically absorbed, you understand. And so the context determines whether it's teaching or doctrine, but truly teaching of truth sanctifies. We know this because Christ prayed it in Gethsemane when he said to the Father, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Truth sanctifies. That's how you get sanctified. It starts in the mind. Isaiah wrote, whom will he teach knowledge? For precept must be upon precept. 
precept on precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. I can see Isaiah in front of the, the whiteboard, right, with his marker. And he's writing down, justification by faith, priesthood of all believers, deity of Christ. He's writing these things down, precept upon precept. You're building, the building blocks of faith are doctrine, Right? And so we have our verse concerning our walk, our life with Christ. And so the question that verse 5 leaves us with is, how do I walk for Christ? The answer comes in various parts, but the first part is always teaching. It's always knowing doctrine. It's always coming to an increasing knowledge of the truth. And the Spirit teaches the truth. Now those of you who believe that the Spirit that your walk with God is radically individualistic, believe that walking after the Spirit is somehow this personal exercise. I want to break down something because I'm not sure we always get the idea when we talk about the Holy Spirit teaching. Because the Holy Spirit uses instruments. He uses means to teach. Do you ever see a preacher? Or te- yep, yep. I, I hope you're not watching too many TV preachers, but I've watched him over the years. And I see the charismatic guy, and he's in, and he's preaching away, and he's preaching away, and then he goes, what's that? Yes, Lord, I'll tell him. Now, let me tell you right now, that is, that is a phony thing that's happening there. That is not how that happens. All right? This man is saying, oh, yes, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll tell him. I hold it, and then he's babbled something in a tongue or something. Friends, that is not the work of the Holy Spirit. That is blasphemy. That's not how it works. You're not, unless you're going to tell me that you're just like Abraham and what he just said to you, you can write down and add it to the Scriptures. Is that what we're saying? When we hear from the Holy Spirit, that's this radical individualistic thing. I don't care what you all say, the Spirit said this to me, and the heck with everyone else and your teaching and your gifts and your love. That's not how it works. Our, the Holy Spirit works through the church in a corporate manner, through the gifts of the Spirit, and those gifts become known to us. And I've always said, whenever I have someone stand in the pulpit for me, I say, your ability to preach and teach and your knowledge are, of course, important, but the main thing is, do you love the souls of the people you're preaching to? That's Job number one of a preacher, to actually advance the souls of the people listening. So this radical individualistic approach to Christianity is harmful. It makes us all our own God, you see. And it makes the church unnecessary. I don't need the church. I hear directly from God and I live my life. There's nothing in the New Testament that would lead us to a conclusion like that. Now, it's a fine beginning to say, I hear directly from the Holy Spirit. That's a fine beginning if you're reading the Word and you're, and you're being convicted by the Spirit or you're, you're coming to service on Sunday morning you'd be convicted by the preaching. That's a fine beginning. But for the believer, sanctification should always become a corporate exercise, and it's gained in and through a body of believers. What did Jesus say to the Ephesians? He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Everyone's not a pastor and teacher, only some. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith. It's a corporate exercise being sanctified. And the knowledge of the Son of God. We're back to knowledge. For we do not get our doctrine by listening to the voice in our head or in our heart, and certainly not an audible voice. Now, I know God can do anything he wants to do, all right? But I am very suspect when people tell me those things. That's not the biblical path to knowledge or sanctification. We increase in knowledge by taking advantage of the spiritual gifts that are present in the body that is the gifts of other believers, that we all come to the unity of the faith, right? He gave the gifts of apostle and prophet and evangelist and pastor teacher to some. And to other people, he gave other gifts. But the teaching, you know, James 3, 1, let not many of you become teachers, for we'll receive a stricter judgment, he says. Let not many of you become teachers. Everyone's not just a teacher. 
You know, I've been to Bible studies where everybody, they put a verse out there or a passage and everyone gives their impression. We throw it in the middle and we, whatever we come up with when it's all mixed together, we say that's the truth that we all run home all satisfied. Friends, a verse of scripture only means one thing. It doesn't have a hundred different meanings. It could have a lot of applications, but it means one thing. And the job of a preacher is to exegete that passage and to find out what it meant when the writer wrote it to the people he intended to read it in the first place. That's what exegesis is. And so teaching becomes fundamental to sanctification, but it happens within a corporate experience. Remember the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts chapter 8. He was moved by the Spirit of God toward his personal salvation. He's reading Isaiah in a chariot. All right? Got to get me a chariot. But it took the assistance of Philip to help him understand what he was reading. It begins as an individual prompting. Listen, God orchestrated this whole thing. An angel told Philip, go down the Gaza road, and you'll find this guy from Africa. Right? And he says, help him understand the scriptures. Preach the gospel to him. And then he says to the, to the eunuch, Pu pull out the Bible and start reading. But it took both things. So from Acts we read, the Ethiopian treasurer was in his chariot reading the scriptures. It was Isaiah. And Philip asked the great... But Philip runs alongside. <laughs> so apparently the horse was pulling the chariot and this guy's reading Isaiah. And he must have been a great man in the first century to have a copy of Isaiah. It would have been a very expensive thing to have. It would have been made in lambskin or vellum, which is... Vellum means veal, so it's, it's you know, calfskin. Um, and so what does Philip ask him? I see you're reading the Bible, but do you understand it? And he says, no. No, I don't. How can I unless someone guides me? First of all, he's probably having trouble with the language. It could have been written in Greek. It could have been the Septuagint version, and certainly that was the common language even in Ethiopia. So maybe he's reading the Septuagint. Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come sit with him. So the eunuch asked of Philip, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Friends, if he got the wrong answer to that question, he could not be saved. Isaiah was not preaching his gospel. He was preaching Christ's gospel. So he needed Philip to tell him what it meant. That's the essential question. Does the prophet say this of himself or of some other man? Only the right answer can lead to salvation. Is Isaiah speaking of himself or of a future Messiah? And so the gifted man climbs up beside the man in the chariot, and this is what we read from Acts. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture preached Jesus to him. His salvation was inspired and empowered by the Holy Spirit, but it was facilitated by the gifted man of the church. Understand? God uses us in this thing. Doctrine is indispensable to sanctification. You know, I remember a time I was in a, um, a Bible study. I was in the church for, I think, one year. And they had a Wednesday or Thursday night Bible study, and I went to it. And I was talking about, I, was, uh, I wasn't teaching it. Um, one of the other men was teaching. And I just brought up a section of the book of Acts as a comparison for something else to illustrate something. And I brought up the section about Ananias and Sapphira. Remember, remember that section? Um, and I realized when I brought it up that no one else, people that had been in the, the, in the, in the faith for years, had never read the, the Bible. And no one knew what I was talking about. And I realized it, and I thought, I've been here one year. I couldn't wait to read this whole thing. And I got these guys that are teaching that have never read the Bible and had no idea what I was talking about. You know, a hundred years ago, a preacher would make all kinds of biblical references. Like I said, I am, you know, call me Ishmael or Captain Ahab or all of those references. And everyone knew what the reference meant. You knew if a guy was named Ahab in literature, he's probably a bad guy, right? <laughs> And if a guy's named Ishmael, he's going to have some trouble. But all of that was gone. We're, we are truly in the post-Christian era. So back to the, uh, the Gaza road there with the eunuch, God was orchestrating this encounter in order to bring the gospel to Africa by the witness of a single important official. 
But he, like we, needed two things. One, he needed a teacher. And two, he needed true doctrine to get saved. Lloyd-Jones writes this, There's an indissoluble association between doctrine and life. So many foolishly say that what they want is to be able to live the life and that they're not concerned about doctrine. To which the simple answer is that it's only the people who really know and understand the doctrine who can live the life. There's no shortcut to holiness. Holiness is developed in us, he goes on, chiefly as the result of our understanding the great doctrines. Friends, I was teaching... Bible study on a Wednesday night many years ago and I went on and on about the cardinal doctrine of our faith I have always said is what? The deity of Christ. Jesus Christ is God. And I talked about it and I talked about the Council of Nicaea that established it in history in 325 AD and I did all this talk about the deity, the deity, the deity of Christ and I see head shaking and people are saying yes and they're agreeing and then one girl raises her hand and she says, Pastor, what's deity? You see what I mean? She didn't even have the basic word, so I lost her. It doesn't hurt to go back and make sure everyone knows even the very basics. What is deity? She didn't know. It was a synonym for God or Godhead. And so I had to explain that. The Reformation was the celebration of understanding. That's what it was. It was a revival of truth. It changed the world. It edified the church. It glorified God. Knowing about God always glorifies God. And so to walk, or rather to live according to the Spirit, is to delve deeply into the essential truths of spiritual reality. And Paul is the great delver. Delver is not a word, but it worked there. Paul's the great delver into truth. And Romans is a deep dive into those very things that are essential to Christian growth and understanding that we call sanctification. So I'm going to go into one of, those, one of those very basic doctrines of our faith because it's mentioned here. And if it gets past us and we don't understand it, we miss the whole point of, really, of the New Testament. Verse 3 says, What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. So he says, What the law could not do, God did. And that's the way to differentiate between law and grace. The law was a righteous guide, to it, but it imparted no internal power to obey it. The law was just a standard. It didn't impart motive power in you to obey it, and no one had the power. But the gospel was different. The gospel came with the Holy Spirit, and it imparted power into you to obey it. That's the difference between law and grace. They both have the same demands, but grace comes with the power to obey it. You can be sanctified, friends. That's the very thing the risen Christ said to his disciples before he ascended to the Father. He said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. There's a power in that, friends. No other religion comes with the power. They just come with the demands, and you've got to do it yourself. Christianity makes demands, but it gives you the power to obey the demands. And so this is a verse that focuses on what God has done to affect our salvation. The law couldn't do it, but God could do it. The law couldn't do it because your flesh was weak. So what did God do? He strengthened the flesh. Gave you the power to obey. So the thing I want to point out here as a basic doctrine is the humanity of Christ. Certainly his deity is important, but his humanity is equally important. He came in the flesh. John wrote that the word became flesh, dwelt among us, we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I'm sure you know those verses from John chapter 1. The verse is packed with so much doctrine, we have to pause and examine the full glory of it. God affected our salvation by sending his son, but he did it by sending his son in the flesh. Isn't that interesting? He didn't send him in some sort of celestial splendor. He sent him into the womb of a literal woman. 
So the fact of the incarnation was essential to our salvation. It said the law couldn't do it, but God did it, and the way he did it was he sent his son in the flesh. In order to grow in Christ and to walk according to the Spirit, we have to be mindful of the things of the Spirit. And the Spirit affected the incarnation. Without the Holy Spirit, there was no incarnation. Just as the Spirit was the agent of our rebirth, He was the essential agent in the birth of the Savior. And so it could be asked, how can this be? I hear unbelievers say that all the time. I hear scoffers say, how could it be that a man, that God got together with a woman and produced a son? How can it be? That's not only our question, friends. That's not only the question of every naysayer, whoever hears the story and regards it as fantasy or myth. But guess what? It was Mary's question. Mary asked the same thing. The angel came and he said, you're going to be found with child by the Holy Spirit. And she said, how? How can this be? And the angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. That's power. He's going to empower you to have God's child. That's how. He doesn't explain all the anatomical, spiritual, mechanical things that are going on. But the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. You've got to wonder what that was like. Therefore also, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Mary's Son would be the Son of God. But what did Jesus call himself? The Son of Man. He focused on his flesh. He wanted to make sure we knew he was a, he was a man. And so once again, the Holy Spirit is said to impart not only the power to believe, but the power to accomplish what God demands of us. He couldn't say to Mary, have God's son. He had to make it happen. There's one thing that we have to understand about our religion, friends. Christianity is based in historical fact. These things actually happened. The power of our faith is that a physical Christ was born to a physical woman. He literally walked the earth and taught and healed and lived, just as the gospel stories tell us. His presence in the world happened in a particular moment in history. It happened in the days when the decree went out from Caesar Augustus, right? They didn't say it happened in, uh, in um, you know, in the year 1 AD. No, they didn't say that because they didn't have that system yet. That system came about centuries later. So in order to tell us when it was, it was when Caesar Augustus was on the throne. And then he makes it even more specific when Quirinius was governing Syria. So you can go back and kind of find where that is, that moment in time. But it was real. And, and Luke wanted to nail it down and let you know that's a historical moment in time. True history is always tied to true faith. Gresham Machen said, Jesus died, that's history. Jesus died for our sins, that's doctrine. Right? The doctrine tells you the meaning of the historical event. And that becomes the doctrine. Friends, the Bible is one-third doctrine. It's one-third law, one-third prophecy, and one-third history, and 100% doctrine is what I meant to say. But um, don't let that relationship escape you, the idea that the history matters. The angel, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel literally came out of heaven to inform the virgin, the virgin rather, that she would bear a son. She literally conversed with the angel. The Holy Spirit of God performed some sort of divine operation on her so that she conceived the very child of God. Jesus was born according to the scriptures in the prescribed manner and at the designated time. And apart from that doctrine, our faith is no faith at all. All of those things had to happen. And so the rest of the New Testament runs with the doctrine of the humanity of Christ. John wrote, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. Paul to the Galatians, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Paul wrote to Philippi, he made himself of no reputation and was made in the likeness of men. To Timothy, he writes, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. To the Hebrews, he said, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. 
And so he runs with the doctrine of the humanity of Christ. And then we read this from 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, that life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard and declare to you, that which you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John is very repetitive here because he's fighting off a heresy of the first century that Jesus was an apparition, and he had no real human body. And John wanted to make sure that you knew that we handled him with our hands. We saw him with our eyes. We heard him with our ears. We fellowshiped with him personally. And John's going to go on to show you just how important Jesus coming in the flesh is. So the written word is rife with these references to the literal, physical, visible, material flesh of the man, Jesus Christ. He even called himself the Son of Man. And woe to those who teach otherwise. What did John write elsewhere? Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And what's the test? How do you test the spirit? By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confess, confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Friends, don't be the spirit of Antichrist. Which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Father, we praise you for the incarnation of Christ this morning and for the revelation of it through your written word by the power of the Holy Spirit and the teachers he sent to teach us, Father. We praise you for the church and the gifts of the Spirit and the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.